Hey, how's everybody doing today? So we're a little earlier than normal, but we had uh, some time necessities that we had to go over. Uh, today, we actually have Seth. He's going to be running the show. Um, he has a debate that he's going to be doing with a friend of his from Holland. So we have uh, Seth and Mariah that are going to be on today. I'm going to bring them on right now and have them introduce themselves and tell you where they're from and let Seth take it from here. So without further ado, here we go. Microphones, guys. What's up, everybody? What's up, Joe? How's it I'm going, Mariah. Man? I'm Seth with Huff's Herps, everybody. And this is Mariah that's joining us. Mariah, where right, exactly are you from? Turn your microphone back on. Let me see here. Missing your mic, Mariah. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> there we I'm go. from the Netherlands, all the way up uh, from the northern part of the Netherlands. And uh, okay. I have a small, fat tail echo breeder here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank both of you, Joe, and especially Mariah, for agreeing to do this uh, such short notice and last minute. Um, I did a video the other day that, you know, as I expected it to, caught a little bit of attention from some of the naturalistic breeders or some of the naturalistic keepers and breeders. And, um, you know, of course, in the advancing groups that they don't want to hear any of it. And so I thought it was a good opportunity to, well, actually you kind of sparked it, Mariah. You, uh, you commented on Greg's little excerpt that he posted on his little reel and we're like, man, I wish more people would talk about this and, and it not be still black and white. Excellent. And, and I, I just threw it out to you like, Hey, you want to do a debate? And you're like, let's do it. So yeah. thank you for being, uh, you know, so willing to just jump into that. Yeah. Of course. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess uh, we'll just jump right into it, right? Um, so first of all, uh, I, I, I think we've heard plenty about me on previous on previous episodes or other podcasts or whatever. So let's hear a little bit about you, Mariah, and then I want to go into like care, you know, requirements and stuff like that. Uh, so for everybody that's watching, this is like solely based on fat tail keeping. Yeah. You can apply it to different animals, however you want. But we are discussing in this podcast, in this debate, just fat tail keeping on racks like I do versus bioactive naturalistic like Mariah does. Um, so just ha keep that in mind for this entire conversation. Um, uh, so let's hear a little bit about you, Mariah. Wh where exactly are you from? How'd you get into fat tails? How long you been into fat tails? All the goods. Yeah, uh, so I started into getting uh, fat tail geckos uh, around four or five years ago after doing an internship at a local reptile store. And uh, I discovered the fat tail gecko and I fell in love with them because they were different than leopard geckos and I really uh, liked their natural environment that's a bit more forestry uh, as opposed to leopard geckos. Okay, so, so with just let me interrupt you for just a second because that's a really important point that I love. So you, first of all, what about them is different? Whenever you say they're different than leopard geckos, what do you mean? Because I have people ask me that at the expos all the time, and I know my answer, but I want to hear your answer. What yeah, is different to you about them than leopard geckos? Yeah, a lot of people ask me the very same question. At first they say, yeah, they look alike, right? And I'm like, no, well, <laughs> they're not the same at all in my eyes. Uh, right. The most important differences to me are, first of all, the enclosure. It's a much more forestry and much uh, more humid than leopard geckos. And so it's easier to uh, use live plants. And I think it's more aesthetically pleasing, uh, personally. Uh, they're also a little bit different in temperament. I <laughs> compare leopard geckos to the extroverted reptiles and... Petto geckos are more introverted that uh, are a bit shy at first, but once you win them over with food, they're your friends. <laughs> so yep, I, I, I have the same comparison, not exact same, but similar. Yeah. I, I have more of a cats and dogs kind of comparison, but yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, exactly. And then they're a bit more compact. They just, they have stubbier uh, toes, stubbier legs, as opposed to the longer legs that leopard geckos have. And personally, I, I 
pretty pretty. <laughs> cool. That's interesting. I've 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 never heard that perspective of like part of what it drew me to them was how they're kept, and that's an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, I like that. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just uh, I wanted to touch on that while we were there because yeah. I always have the same question of how they're different, and I agree the personalities are totally different. I can I think fat tails are a little more like cats where they'll like not as outgoing and not begging to come out like a Leo will. But once you get them out, they're like, Oh, okay. You want to cuddle? Let's cuddle. Whereas yeah. a leopard gecko is more outgoing and might be more begging to come out. But then once you get them out, they're like dogs and they're like all over the place. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, what's yeah. Next, what's where are we going to go hide next? And so like, that's the comparison I make to people. Yeah. Um, that's, that's also very true. Yeah. 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 But I like that too. Extrovert and introvert. That's, that's a good one too. I'll, I'll have to use that. So, so go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll try not to do that, but I'll, I'll probably do it again. <laughs> yeah. So I started with just the pets. Uh, but then as I learned more about African fetal geckos, I noticed how they're just not as much available as leopard geckos. And on reptile expos, I just saw wild caught animals. And I was like, why, why are we doing that? Because they're not difficult to breed at all. So that's when I decided uh, I wanted to get into breeding. Um, and I also have a background in animal management. So over the years, I have learned a lot of, uh, about topics like nature, ecology, wild animals, and topics related to that. So when I got into reptile keeping, I really wanted to apply that knowledge into the way that I keep fetal geckos, not to make just a bioactive enclosure, but to really understand how these guys live in the wild and how I could recreate that in my care. Uh, for example, you see like the bio dude, the, he is very famous into the bioactive corner of reptile keeping. And he made a bioactive enclosure for fetal geckos as well. Like when you Google bioactive setup fetal gecko, that's the first thing you see. And I had a little bit of struggle with that because when you looked at the enclosure, it was very uh, a jungle vibe, like tropical forest and that was not quite the natural environment of fetal geckos. And I just didn't understand how you could make a pretty enclosure, but then not having a resemblance of the wild environment. So that's when I started to really dig into the wild uh, habitat of the fetal geckos. And I really wanted to recreate that. And I wanted to show that to other people as well. So that's why I, uh, started this whole thing <laughs> and also to show people how fun fetal geckos are i think the best way to educate people is by showing them and to present on my account and just talk about them and yeah just lead by example i guess in that sense so that's why i uh, got into the breeding stuff and i've been doing that for a couple of years now so <laughs> I agree. I agree hundred percent as far as, uh, you know, just educating people by exposing them to, to these awesome animals and, and in, in so many ways, exposing them to their beauty, exposing them to their cool personalities. I found that when you just put a fat, fat tail in somebody's hands at an expo and they just melt into their palm and curl up and go to sleep, they're just like, Oh my gosh, I need this, yeah. you know, and not, not to encourage impulse buys, but I mean, people are there to impulse buy anyway. So I, I would rather educate them properly and have them impulse buy an animal that's actually a good starter reptile bat rather than impulse buying a sulcata tortoise or a green iguana or, you know, a bearded dragon or something that is not the greatest starter. But anyway, yeah. um, so how long ago did you first get into fat tails, Mariah? When was that? Four years ago. Yeah. Four years ago is when you first started learning about them or that's when you like first started like buying them or both? Both. <laughs> both. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what kind of research did you dive into when you say at that point you weren't happy with, you know, what a certain site had and you wanted better? How did you dive into that from there? What, what was your next step? Uh, well, because uh, I study animal management, I kind of knew how to search for reliable sources. And there weren't a lot of that at all, but there were some that were well written and there was one scientific article and I kind of went from there. And so at first I really had uh, basic care, not uh, into the wildlife plants at all. But later on, 
I saw that video of Dave Kaufman and that really helped. That was an amazing video. And I also Googled plant species that naturally occurred in the same uh, habitat as the fetal gecko and then uh, went and bought those plant species. So Oh, you're even using identical plants that are, yeah. oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So that's an interesting point that you made about like, you weren't satisfied with the tropical just run of the mill and you wanted it more dialed in because that's something I tell people a lot at the expos. Cause here's, so here's one thing I do. And I'm going to talk about the expos a lot. Cause I do a lot of expos, but one thing that I, I don't like at, you know, when I'm at the expos it about my setup, as much as I'm happy with my overall setup is I do a lot of bioactive enclosures like tropical arboreal bioactives, because we do sell some gargoyles and I have best friends that sell lychees and cresties and gargs. And so like I sell a lot of those and that's kind of, that's what pays for my tables basically is the profit I make from those cages I make. Um, and then I have my gecko, you know, I'll have a couple gargoyle geckos and then I have all my Leos and fat tails. And then I'll have a small stack of, you know, my cages that I sell with those guys. And there's a obvious, and I know I'm doing it to myself, but there's a, a common misconception when people walk up to my table and they're like, Oh, well, we want this enclosure with this gecko and they're wanting the tropical arboreal. And I'm like, no, you can't, you know, and I have to explain to them. And again, I know I've noted it to myself. I need to either make more signage or have my booth more separated or something like that, but, or just stop doing the bios altogether. But I, I enjoy doing them and people like them. So it's hard not to. Uh, but my point is I have to tell people all the time. I have to explain to people all the time that you can't, force an animal to make itself work in an enclosure just because this is what you like the look of and this yeah. is and, and this is how you want it to look or this is how you want to take care of an enclosure that is naturalistic um you have to make sure that you're doing the opposite you're molding that enclosure around that animal's needs that specific exactly. animal's needs and that's yeah. i think that's a mark that a lot of people miss whenever they're you know, thinking about doing bioactives or doing bioactives and going that route. That's one of the big things that people aren't thinking about the big picture of is like, what does this animal need as opposed to, you know, what can I make this animal fit into? Cause this yeah. is what I want, you know? I completely um, agree. Yeah. And that you, you had a good example of that in the beginning of saying like, I knew that I kind of wanted not the desert, not the desert, but like you didn't want the, the semi, you know, arid, you know, submontanous, uh, you know, type of enclosure. You kind of wanted something a little more in between. So you kind of bridged that gap on your own of being like, right. okay, well, I know what I want. So I'm going to, and, and I kind of like this animal. And then you just kind of gravitated to it. Right. That, yeah. That's cool. Um, so wildcard asked a good question. What kind of plants are you using? Yeah. Um, I have a list in my Instagram stories. Uh, so if oh. you forget it after this podcast or whatever, or you need to revisit it, you can go to my Instagram's uh, highlight and then uh, you see a tab that says enclosures and there it says everything about my enclosures and also a plant, list, uh, plant species list. But to uh, name a few, I have snake plants. I have dragon plants. I have the desert rose. And the, the, I don't know the name, the English name. That's some of the easiest plant names Spider. I've ever heard. Yeah, they are very hardy plants. And what was the last one? Yeah. What was the last one? Spider plants. Spider. Yeah. Okay. I'm familiar with the spider plant. I actually have one of those. I didn't know those were native to Africa. Yeah, if, according to my source, uh, they occur in the same uh, region uh, as uh, Africa. So that's great. I'm really gotcha. happy with that. So um, in your research, what did you find? I guess that's my next question. Uh, like whenever you dove into that and you found a couple of different resources, first of all, do you happen to remember the name of that, that the best uh, resource that you did find? Um, the, the best source was the video of Dave Kaufman that you know, and the, the scientific article that I sent you. Okay. Yeah. And I've had some, I've had some people argue about the, uh, Dave Kaufman video only being such a small snapshot of temperatures and that that's not a good scientific study because of the lack of data. Yeah. Um, 
But, but that I mean, was funny yeah. to me because to talk about the discussion in the advancing husbandry group a little bit for the people who didn't know, uh, the people uh, said that uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit was fine as a nighttime temperature for fetal geckos. And, yes. Um, uh, it, to, quote, to quote specifically, sorry to interrupt you again, but to quote specifically, um, they say they say that no secondary heat source is needed as long as your house doesn't get below 64 degrees. Yeah. Um, and and I, I wasn't aware of that. I've been sending people to that to that group like for years because I knew that they had a pretty good rundown of everything overall especially as far as like specifics on lighting and, and plants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, it's a really well put together rundown. And so I've been sending people there for years because again, like, you know, or I, I don't guess I explained it yet, but like, I don't keep them on bio. I keep them on racks. And so as a result, whenever I'm dealing with people that are wanting to know how to keep them on bio, I have a hard time explaining that to people because I don't practice it. I kind of know the gist of it, but I, I don't want to tell them the wrong way. So I usually tell them, here's how you keep them, you know, on a simple Simon setup, which is more of a quarantine setup anyway that you need to start with. Yeah. And then here's some resources for you to learn on your own of how to keep them naturalistically, because I don't want to steer you wrong. And that's what I always tell people. And everybody, that's the whole purpose of this podcast is to get info from Mariah, who's actually practicing it to be able to, for me to be able to have a resource to send to people. But anyway, back to the care sheet, everything looks good on it. And I never realized that they had that statement in there about not needing supplemental heat if you're above 64 degrees. And so I kind of raised question to it. And one of the members in there raised question. I raised question to it in my group. And then one of the members raised question to it in the group itself and was met with just some quick snap screenshots of, you know, a a climate chart that has a couple of lows that are in that range, a couple of nights, yeah. a couple of months out of the year, you know, and when we're, uh, and I want to focus on when you see a low temp, what that means. That does not mean that's what the temp was all night long. When you see 65 degrees, you know, for a certain month of the year in wh whatever range of Africa we're talking about, and it was a hundred degrees all day long. Um, you got to think about, first of all, that 65 degree mark that you're seeing is what it saw at twilight at sunrise is whenever that night temp got down to that low. Those animals weren't experiencing that all night long. It the sunset, it was 110 degrees outside. So it gradually dropped to where at eight or nine, it was probably mid eighties, just like Dave Kaufman's video illustrates. He yeah. took air temp at nine o'clock. I think he said, and it was like 84 degrees or 85. Yeah. Um, the weird thing was, sorry to interrupt you. The weird thing was, no, they, they stated a scientific article, and that was a scientific study that was done over a period of two years. And right. sure, there have been some colder days. Uh, right. but on average, the, the night temperature didn't drop below uh, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So they right. didn't even read the scientific study uh, properly. Because exactly. I read that, and I was like, we yeah. should provide the best care for them. Yeah. Uh, adult fetal geckos are quite hardy and they can survive a lot, but that doesn't mean that it's natural for them and what's best. And the whole point of bioactive and natural is to do it uh, to the best uh, care possible to the fetal gecko, I would yep. assume. So and, that's and, very weird to me. Yeah, and a couple of the things that I don't think they're taking into account there is, like I said, first of all, that high temp that you're seeing or that low temp you're seeing is the very wee hours of the morning right at sunrise it's not all night it's a very gradual yeah. drop yeah. um and second of all there's several factors but second of all you're not factoring in the ground temp that these animals have to escape to once it does cool off past their comfort comfort zone uh because that ground is definitely absolutely going to hold a lot of heat yeah um the 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 other temperature reading that dave kaufman took in that video was during the day inside the mound of one that they caught and it was 94 degree internal ground temp. So it's going to take a long time for that ground temp to dr drop from 94 degrees, 95 degrees, all the way down to anywhere near 65 degrees. It's not going to happen on a very regular basis. And another, this again, there's so many important factors. Another thing is 
they're taking those extreme temps that those animals may experience on a few days of the year, a few months of the year. And they're saying, okay, because this animal can experience this and they can tolerate it, we're going to force it to experience this every single night, all night long. Those and nights. that's just, in, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, it's not logical and it's the most unnatural thing I can think of. Now, if you want to take a few months out of the year and say, okay, I'm going to brumate my animals and make them as, as natural as possible and really recreate this, then that's one thing to like focus it and, and dial things down and fast them properly and have that effect. But if you're trying to do it all year long, that's completely unnatural. And th that alone is just insane to me. Um, and, and this isn't to bash any groups or bash any body that's doing it a certain way. These, these animals, there's all different kinds of ways of keeping. And if you're keeping with no heat, no supplemental heat overnight, and you've got adult animals that you've had for years and they're doing fine, cool, more power to you. I'm sure you have a fairly warm room temp, and I'm sure you have a very uh, elaborate setup that holds a lot of heat. I would argue that it's still not the same as their ground heat that gets held in the wild. If you're really trying to go, you know, a hundred percent simulation of the wild, but we'll get to that in a minute. But, um, the other, another really important factor that I don't think is taking into account in these, in these care sheets and articles is whenever you have that, that, that cold of a temp without, um, without uh without it being the right time of year okay when you've got babies coming in to that enclosure in the wild those babies are it, it, there's a reason that there's breeding season and there's a re reason that there's a certain time that the females lay eggs and a certain time those eggs hatch yeah. because those babies need a certain environment to be able to thrive and we know that from raising babies that if you don't have it just right dialed in that they're not going to thrive they're yeah. not nearly as hardy they're you know Conversely, they're way more fragile than a juvenile or a subadult or an adult, obviously. Absolutely. And so I think that's a big thing they're missing is they're putting this information out there and saying, this is how you do it. And people are getting an eight gram gecko, which, by the way, I'll never sell a gecko that young for this reason. I will always grow mine out to usually about 15 grams before they go anywhere. Um, and this is why, because you need some buffer zone there, because a lot of people are are new to this especially with these species because it's a, a more of a beginner species and we cater to the newer people and so you have to account for that and realize that these people may not know exactly what they're doing and how they need to do it and so they're getting a little bitty eight gram baby from some drop shipper at an expo and they're going home and they're putting it in this nice setup they've, they've been researching for a year or two years and they 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 think they've got it perfect man it's just Temps are perfect. Their 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 heating their uh their basking spot is perfect. You know everything's dialed in, but there's no heat at night. Okay, and if it was an adult gecko, it would probably be okay yeah. if the if the room was warm enough. But with these babies, I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, they will not thrive in that environment. They are going to just shut down and not want to eat, and they're going to hide on the warm side all the time, and you're never going to see them. And I, I mean, and this is speaking from experience. I get these messages all the time, mostly not from my customers because I take a lot of time to educate my customers really well when they get a gecko from me. Um, but a lot of times it's from other people that got a gecko from either somebody else or from a pet store or from, you know, just some random show. And they're in a, one of the groups and, and just, you can see them struggling a lot, you know, and so anyway, that's my biggest pet peeve about that no heat at night thing is I agree reptiles definitely need to cool down. I mean, you can uh, you can go anywhere in the world and you're going to see a drastic cool down, you know, some more than others at night. I agree they need a cool down, but I don't agree with it being from the proper temp of 90 degrees all the way down to our house temps that are 65, 70 degrees. And that's, and just to kind of snowball another point in there, another thing that I think they're not taking into account in these care sheets is they're, they're, ta they're talking about a target temp, right? And they're, they've got the right temperature. They're saying they need 90 degrees or 92 degrees or 94 degrees. I agree. That's the right temp for a fat tail. But what they're doing is they're targeting that in their basking spot. Okay. And in the cases that they're doing a 
stack of hides. I, I don't remember. I think they call it a hide stack or something like that in the groups. Um, you're going to be hitting it pretty close because they're going to have hides at different levels, but there's still not, again, back to the Dave Kaufman video. They caught a fat tail in a termite mount, measured inside that termite mount, and it was 94 degrees. Okay. So if you're getting 94 degrees at the top of that hide stack, then you're definitely not getting 94 degrees at the bottom wherever they're where they would prefer to be because fat tails are not big on climbing they're kind of clumsy um they can climb i'm not saying they're you know completely like can't do it but yeah, they're not nearly the climbers that leos are for sure they don't have the same claw structure yeah um, usually during the day they will hide and then at night sometimes they will climb is what i have experienced that, during the day that's what i was Yep, I was absolutely about to get into it and ask you what the activity level you see from your animals. Because you, first of all, hang on, let's back up a little bit. I, I went off on a, on a tangent. Sorry, guys. Um, I do that a lot. So let me back up and get to my notes, okay, and, and make sure that I don't miss something. So yeah. first of all, I'm going to run through a quick fat tail care overview with you and kind of just bounce back and forth of what I have on my care sheet and what you have on your care sheet, basically. Okay. Um, so tips, what, what tips do you like for fat tails? What do you like to teach people? Uh, on the hot side, I do, uh, I never do Fahrenheit, but <laughs> 92. Oh, Fahrenheit. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead and spit Celsius. Uh, we'll, us Americans can convert it. Down. I did write it. Down. Um, yeah, 92 F, uh, Fahrenheit on overall on the warm side of the enclosure. And then the cool side is around 85 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. Okay. And then during the night, I have a heat mat for the hot on the hot side. That's also very important because it doesn't make sense to change hot sides. So I have a heat mat on the hot side, and there it gets around 90 degrees Fahrenheit on, in their favorite height. And then the ambient temperature is at lowest 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's okay. kind of my heating setup. Okay. And so... First of all, do they, do you see them, hang on, first of all, you say 92 degrees hot side during the day, is that like inside their hide or that's under the basking light, like in the that's basking spot, yeah. inside their hide, what is your temp, do you have a measurement for like under the basking light, because you use, you use a basking light, right? Yeah, yeah, hello. Right, a heat lamp? Heat lamp, <laughs> yeah, that's correct, I think exactly under the whole spot it gets 94, 95 max. I guess. Okay. And then you have a hide right below that, that registers about 92, right? Yeah. yeah a little bit okay. to the back of the enclosure, but yeah, around. Okay. The and then, and then I agree. You don't need a, you don't need the heating pad on the other side. You need to keep the hot side on the hot side. Um, yes. While we're on that right there, let's talk about that. Okay. So one thing that uh, my, another friend of mine named Mariah, who is the, the girl that does the reptophiles, right? Um, if y'all haven't checked her out, check her out. Uh, reptiles.com, I think, or she's on Instagram, just reptiles. But I met her at the Salt Lake City Expo. She was vending next to me. And it was really neat because we were right there next to each other. And we were, she was doing what I'm always doing at expos, just teaching people about what the animals that they're getting or the animal they got or the animal they have at home, whether they were getting anything from me or not. Um, she, that's all she does at the expo. She goes and sets up with an eight foot table of care sheets for all different species. And she stands out there and doesn't sell a single thing. She just informs people. She just educates that's people. Nice. How cool is that? Yeah. That's like it, it was, it was so neat having her next to me. Cause I was like, I would teach them how I, you know, like I said, I teach them the quarantine way and like the basics and I give them my care sheet and then I go and then just jump right over to Mar to Mariah and she'll teach you about how to keep them bioactive. And yeah. so it was really cool and convenient to have her right there next to me. But anyway, um, I was talking to her yesterday on the phone and she was telling me about, she was teaching me about the differences that they've, you know, I don't know how recently, but some of the recent research about the differences between infrared A and infrared C, right? So the infrared A is from what you get from a heat lamp. That's the, the penetrative heat that you get from sunlight, right? Yeah. And that is the most energizing heat for a reptile. And I totally get that. And I totally understand why a beardy and a Euromastix and a iguana or, a, you know, any of those, a monitor, any diurnal, uh, you know, animal like that would need that penetrative heat. 
But my question here is with, and, and this is going to go right back into the follow-up of, of what you were talking about, about your activity level and your fat tails. First of all, no, no, let me finish my thought and then we'll go. Um, my question is in the wild, that termite mound that's beat by the sun all day with the infrared A, that heat that that termite mound is now holding is now infrared C. Am I understanding that right? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. But well, I'm not the biggest heat lamp uh, expert. Um, okay. It just made a, a, the most sense to also provide overhead heating besides uh, heat mats because it's the natural thing to do because natural okay. so, also uh, come. So, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna be. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. No, that I am no thank you, thank you. Hey, you know what? That's the most important thing that you can be able to do in this hobby is say, I don't know, because too many people just talk out of their ass without knowing what they're talking about and, and aren't humble enough to say, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Let's look it up, you know? Um, so I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, from my conversation with Mariah yesterday, I think that I'm correct there. And if anybody in the comments section knows what I'm talking about on a better level than I do or than Mariah does, please feel free to comment and correct me or confirm with me. But I think that once that energy is, is stored in that termite mound, as the sun goes down, now you have a 95 degree termite mound. That's going to start gradually cooling off very slowly, right? Especially a foot down deep in it. So to my understanding, now you have infrared C heat, radiant heat, right? That's stored in that termite mound. Yeah. So where I'm really confused is on these advancing her, her, herpetological groups or these advancing husbandry groups or whatever, how they're saying that it, an undertank heater is completely unnatural in our home setting when we're trying to mimic this, this weird conundrum of the West African Sahara, right? Um, what's the best way to do that? To me, uh, uh, just like you're doing it, exactly how you're doing it. So your heaters are off during the day and they come on at night. Is that how you do it? Are they yeah. on all day? They're completely yeah. off during the day? Yeah. So I think you're doing it perfectly because to me, that is doing what the sun would do during the day. It gives them that basking area if they want to use it. And it's heating up that warm side to the temp that it would be in the wild, that 90 plus degrees that they would be in their burrow. And then when the sun goes down, when your lights go off, that heating pad warms up to maintain that burrow temp yeah. just like it would in the wild. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's exactly how i would think that you would properly set it up if you're really trying to be as naturalistic as possible and and now let's point out we're talking about african fat tail geckos okay that's not to say that this is what a leopard gecko needs that's not to say this is certainly what a more temperate species would need like like i keep a i keep three-toed box turtles and those guys can deal with some really cold temps i mean they can freeze you know yeah. um and so I don't worry about them at all. My adults stay outside all winter and my babies, I don't have any supplemental heat at all. Um, I don't even have any heat on them during the winter time on their cage indoors because I want them to experience a little bit of a, a, a brumation effect. But yeah. you got to really think about what you're working with, what you have and where they're from. Uh, same thing with my Euromastics. Um, my hotspot is insanely hot for him, but... I don't have any supplemental heat for him at night because in the deserts where he's from, it really does cool off significantly every night. And the way that he acts tells me that he doesn't need any supplemental heat because I don't see him after about noon, one o'clock, he goes in his burrow. He's done with his heat lamp and I don't see him again until the next morning. So that's, and now let's go ahead and snowball that into you tell us what is the observation you have of the activity level of your fat tails in that setup. Now that we know what your setup is and how you have it as far as the heat, you know, transfer the, the heat alternate alternation, um, heat lamp to under tank heater. Sorry guys, I'm stumbling all over words, <laughs> my words. Now tell us what activity level do you see? Do you see them out when the lights are out? Do you see them basking in the, in the basking area? Before I answer that question, I had a question. Uh, how is the humidity handled in a bio enclosure and how does this help the temp? I thought to answer that question real quick. Yeah, sure. Else yeah. I would get it. Um, I missed once a day 
uh, typically in the in the rainy season, not during the dry season. And I have wooden enclosures, so they are really holding humidity very very well. So the substrate stays a little bit moist for a while, and the temperature decreases temporarily for one or two degrees. And um, yeah, it, it stays relatively stable because the substrate is moist. Uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and do you have, well, and we'll, we'll dive more into that in a minute. That was my next question with humidity for you as well. Um, so okay, what's so. your, what's the, no, it's all, it's all good. Um, what's your activity level that you see on your fat tails? Do you see them out before lights out? Do you see them come back? Yeah, I have, I am really excited to talk about this. So a little thing that is really important to mention before I answer this question is my UVB and my uh, LED lights are not them are on an on and off system, but the UVB gradually comes out and gradually turns down. And okay. I also have a dimming thermostat on my heat lamp. So in the evening, everything slowly, slowly decreases. So you have a sunrise and sunset type of setup. And so since, translation, uh, translation, guys, she's put some money into her system. Okay. She, she didn't hold back on her. Yeah. <laughs> to. Right. Um, That's cool. Okay. No, so go ahead. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I really noticed that my fetal geckos, uh, uh, became active at around 8 PM and then they were starting to roam around in the enclosure and then that continued during the night. And one thing that was really interesting is that this also applies to my light sensitive geckos. There are a few fetal gecko morphs that are light sensitive. Okay, uh, hang on. Let me interrupt you. Stop. Back up. I missed. I was reading a comment. What time do your lights turn off and when do your geckos come out? Oh, yeah. My lights turn off at 9 p.m. and my okay. geckos become active at around 8 p.m. Okay, so, but and. Are your lights still full blast at, at 8 p.m. or are they already no. starting on the wind on no, the uh, downfall? From 12 to 3 p.m. they're full blast. So then the UVB is strongest uh, and the LED is strongest and the heat is strongest. And then after okay. 3 p.m. the LED completely shuts off. So then you only have the UVB and the heat lamp. And then those start to uh, slow down already at 3 p.m. And then at 8 p.m. there's a little bit of heat lamp, a little bit of UVB. So... Uh, then it's like okay and then basically just very low light for that last hour yeah and yeah. that's when you're seeing that activity is, is yeah. in that last hour of twilight okay yeah during the day sometimes and then, sorry <laughs> during the day sometimes. no go ahead no the geckos that i own the longest are already very comfortable with me being in the room so they will hide in plain view sometimes or partially uh, uh, with their body exposed. And the geckos that I have a little shorter, they typically stay in their termite mounds that I made for them. Uh, so they uh, choose to fully uh, subtract from the view, but some of them uh, stay out and about uh, and sleep just with their heads sticking out or their feet sticking out. And when I feed them, they are like, <laughs> give me food so that's that's a little bit of activity and, during the day but and that's during the day yeah yeah well sometimes so you do get some, you during do. the day i try to do it on in the evening mostly but sometimes i don't have the time to do it otherwise and then right they always come up to me like hey got food <laughs> so, so yeah. you get you get cryptic basking and you get uh in that activity last hour are they coming out in seek like, are they seeking the light when they come out that last hour? Or are they just starting their evening rounds? Can, They're you, starting can you comment on that? Yeah. They're starting yeah. their evening rounds. They're not like going straight to the basking spot and going, oh, finally, I get to I get this. No. But no. they're not scared of the light. And that's, no. you said, including your morph animals, what morphs are you keeping in the environment? Uh, I have a snow. So that's a combination of caramel and Oreo. And the caramel mm -hmm. part makes it light sensitive. I have a caramel mm -hmm. sulu caramel part makes it light sensitive and an amyl mm -hmm. gecko and that's also a light sensitive i also have a ghost but i didn't notice any light sensitivity with her really i heard they sometimes have it but i didn't notice it with her but uh, yeah i yeah. haven't seen it i haven't seen much light sensitivity with my ghosts either um not as much as not really any uh which i think they're more of a hypo rather than a, an albinism yeah understanding um, yeah 
that would make more sense. Cool. But yeah, I well, that's in tubs because I was really concerned about the heating just fully blasting on them. But uh -huh. uh, luckily, Lu uh, Arca Arcadia. <laughs> Well, butchering that pronunciation. But anyway, <laughs> Arcadia. Oh, you got it. That's it. Arcadia. Oh, yay. <laughs> uh, Lamps the uh, Lumini, so then you can turn it off to them. And uh, that's really nice. So that's a specific lamp that they have? Yeah. And you can adjust it to your own liking to turn it up, turn it down. So Look, that's Bubba's got an um Bubba's got a great question that uh, Joe just threw up there. Are ghosts infertile? Yes. Uh, to our knowledge, yes. Female visual ghosts are infertile. Males, there's no problem with the males, but as far as I know, all female visual ghosts are infertile. They cannot, pr they'll produce follicles and ovum and you can pair them and it'll look like eggs are developing and then it'll just, sometimes they can even have health issues. So it's kind of frowned upon to even try them um, because of that. So yeah, good question. Uh, as, well as, as well as caramel, as well as caramel females, which Mariah was about to throw out there. Yep. Caramel females as well. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people don't even work with them because of that. I think that's kind of silly because people still like them. People will still buy the females as pets for, you know, fairly decent price, probably more than you would sell most other pet geckos. Um, so I still produce a little bit of them. I'll definitely be producing a bit of ghosts here moving, moving forward. But, um, yeah, good question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, so let's move on. That's that's awesome info. Thank you very much for that breakdown. It's good to hear uh, that cryptic basking isn't bullshit with this species, that they do use it. Um, and uh, yeah, cool. Let's move on to the humidity. You already mentioned a little bit of how you keep how you how you maintain it. What are you trying to maintain? Are you trying to maintain the whole enclosure to one humidity or you have a hydro gradient? Just like you have a thermal gradient to where they have a humid corner and a drier corner. How, yeah. how do you work it? Uh, I think, well, it's impossible for me to in maintain a, a steady humidity all over the enclosure. Because water will naturally evaporate more easily on the warm side of the enclosure. So I just missed everything and I water the plants once a week. So then the overall humidity rises, but the, on the whole side, it's very quickly gone quite a bit so i i do try to stay consistent with the substrate being a little bit damp not entirely dried out so that's the main thing that's stable but the overall humidity is on the cooler side a little bit higher than on the uh, and do you have like a humid hide is what i call it uh it's just like a little sauna box do you have something like that or you just have just the general humidity of the enclosure yeah yeah. Um, that's something that I think maybe, uh, you know, the, the bridge and the gap might, uh, help on the, on the naturalistic side of things. That's something that a lot of the rat keepers use regularly is humid hides because we don't have the substrate in there to, to maintain the humidity. Yeah. And that's something that even if you do a naturalistic style humid hide, um, what behaviors do you use? Uh, we'll go. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute, Ella. On the on the um, you can do a similar style of humid high, but that can give you a more dedicated humid like region, and then it'll kind of dissipate from there. I know that's what I do in like in my turtle enclosure. Um, I keep one corner super wet, and then they have a little a little hiding place right there, a little cork round that they can go in, and then the other side is a lot drier. But anyway um that's but i'm sure you don't have any shedding issues or anything huh no to, i to, this was actually funny i used to have shedding issues when i kept everything in tubs for a while but not in my enclosures never oh okay so that's nice <laughs> cool um so somebody asked what kind of behavior differences I see. Um, I, I see very similar behavior actually. Um, they, they, mine don't come out really much at all in the daytime, especially my light sensitive ones. Um, actually, whenever I come in in the morning, one of my AML boys is always right in front of his tub whenever I first get in and, you know, I'm usually getting here about eight, nine o'clock in the morning and I flip the lights on in that room and he instantly just like, closes his eyes and you know within a few minutes he's gone he just finds his way to his hide and he's gone um 
So I see pretty similar behavior. They'll come out like, and it's, it's really weird because I just moved into, into my shop about a year ago and I'm still in the process of getting the lighting all like I want it to where it's all on a timer and, and really on a good cycle as far as the general ambient lighting in the rooms. But I have a pretty big window in the front, so it lights up the majority. Of, like right now, this is this is all daylight you're seeing coming in from the front. Um, I got all my lights off in here to avoid glare. So what I'm getting at is even being in here and not having as direct of a light cycle as they did in the room they were in previous, they still seem to really have a good idea of when it's light and dark outside. You know, and and I've heard that from even people that keep their animals like in a basement setting where there aren't any windows at all that they it's like their animals still know what's up. And I, I don't I'm sure there's a lot more science to that than I, that I'm not nearly smart enough to, to know about. Um, but. Yeah, I see sim very similar about an hour before sunset, I'll see them start to roam out, even if I'm still in there with the lights on, um, with the exception of that email boy, I, don't, I usually don't see him until it's lights out. But um most of them are starting to roam around around eight o'clock or, or if they hear me in there shaking crickets around they're they're seeing what's up, just kind of like you're saying, buddy. Yeah. But I just like, Hey, what did I just hear? You know, um, they really get to know those trigger sounds and know what's going on. Um, but yeah, very similar, uh, activity in my experience. Now I don't have cameras and stuff. Do you have cameras in your case to, to be able to see them all night? But I no. Sadly not. I don't, I don't either. I'm not that high tech. Um, no. <laughs> I, I'd like to, um, and another, another reason I'm doing this and, and want to have this conversation is I want to set up a few bioactive and naturalistic style enclosures so that I am practicing it myself. And I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment with it and have like different nighttime lows in identical enclosures and put like identical age babies of about the same genetics in those three enclosures and kind of do a little bit of a data, you know, a, a research experiment, if you will, and collect some data uh, of actual what these guys prefer. Yeah. Um, because, and, and I'm actually kind of surprised to hear that you don't have a little bit more of a night drop in yours. Um, do you see that they use the cooler side a lot more like at night when they're roaming around, do they go hang out a lot on the cool side? Like they're like, would prefer that cooler side. Usually they'll do like their whole exploring thing. They go all over the enclosure and then they return to their favorite height. They really Which is usually their hot hide. Yeah. Every, every single one of them, that's their, that's their favorite hide? Yeah. And you have cool hides on the yeah. cool side, right? And how they, big are your enclosures? They sometimes use it, but they always return eventually to their favorite safe spot, I guess. How, how big are your enclosures, Mariah? They're um, in centimeters, 80 by 40 <laughs> by 40, which translates okay. to 32 inches by 16 inches by 16 inches. Okay. That's a, yeah. that's a nice size enclosure. And you've got two stacks right there behind you. Is it that whole room that you're in is all full of, full of those? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And how many adults do you, are you keeping like that on, on that style enclosure? I currently have 17 adult geckos and I keep 14 in natural listing enclosures because I have one that's too young to go into their adult enclosure. I have one that's still in quarantine and I have one that's unfortunately uh, a bit stressed out and has lot, uh, lost some weight due to that. So she's in recovery. So okay. those are the exceptions, but overall they're all in uh, the enclosures. Awesome. Um, and what exactly lighting wise are you using? I know you kind of briefed over it earlier, but let's get into like the specifics of it. What's the exact UVB that you're running? I have the Luminize 7% Shade Dweller UVB and uh, the LED light with the color, temperature color of uh, 3500K because that's the same color as sunlight is supposed to be. Okay. And that's for the, that's plant light right there, right? The, the LED light that's for yeah. the plants. Yeah. Okay. And then what heat lamp are you running? A halogen heat lamp on a dimming thermostat. Halogen and what wattage in that setting? I know every application is different. 35. What are you using? Yeah, 35 30. watt in those enclosures. These lamps are insanely efficient. <laughs> right. 
so I only use uh, 35 watt and then on the dimming thermostat because sometimes it gets uh, a little bit too hot and then the dimming thermostat can maintain that so that was uh, and then you have uh, I know this isn't lighting but just as far as heat sources then you have like a four by six under tank heater on yeah. on the hot side and how do you run that you have that just inside the enclosure yeah with a, slate, a slate on top of it or what's what's your setup there uh, I have the substrate on top of that. Okay. And how much substrate are you looking at on top of that? Like a couple inches? Yeah. About two inches? Quite a few inches. Or, or centimeters, rather? Um, yeah, I and think then... three, three, four centimeters. I have no idea how much it is. Okay. <laughs> um, and... Okay. So I think that covers it on lighting. Anybody else have any other setup? Any uh, lighting questions? Please hit them in the comments. What's up, Nick? Look, that's the that's the the grandfather godfather of Fat Tails right there, guys. <laughs> he's been he's been doing it for longer than any of us. When we were all in diapers, Nick was breeding fat tails. Like that's fact. Um so check it out. Uh next thing I want to go over is, and I'm just going through what I talk to people about, what's the most important whenever I'm explaining a setup for them. Um supplementation. What do you what's your regimen on supplementation? And by the way, as far as heating everything, I 100% agree with your ranges. Uh, 90 to 92 is what I always tell people hot spot. Anything below 90 for their daytime hot spot, I really find they have issues. Um, I don't think night drops should be any lower than 77. Um, and that's based off of actual info that I've gotten from those advancing husbandry groups of saying brumation yeah. should be 66 to 77. That tells me that you need to be above brumation temp for your typical nighttime lows um if you want to simulate a brumation awesome fast and properly graduate into it as far as your temps go and do a brumation if you're not trying to do a brumation then don't go down that low um so anyway on the supplementation what do you do uh um, yeah and, and that's a good question too ella what's your day and night cycle hour wise yeah what so I um the heat lamp and the luminize are turned on at 9 a.m and they turn off at 9 p.m and the luminize um, is first set at 25% and then they're at 100% at 12 p.m. and until 3 p.m. And then after that, they gradually go down to 25% again. And the LED LEDs are only on from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. That's and again, that, that, the LEDs are just for the really bright, high daylight and for your plants. Yeah. And and you don't see many fat tails out during that time of day at all. Not really. Other maybe than a little, maybe a little bit of crypt, cryptic basking, if anything. Yeah, okay. definitely. Um, and then uh, okay, supplementation. How do you? Yeah. What's your supplementation? Uh, I use uh, vitamin. Uh, like wait, <laughs> let me say this good in English. I use calcium powder plus vitamin D three. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so even with the UVB, you still use the D3. I agree with that. And I actually, yeah. uh, my friend Mariah that I was talking to yesterday also agreed with that because you don't want to not provide it and they not be using the UVB and then they not get the D3. Like it's one of those things, like it's better to have it and not need it than need, than need it, not have it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's and then do you hard. use, sorry, <laughs> no, go ahead. What? to get uh, overdosage of that stuff. And yeah, that's, that's uh, really a myth. That's from back in the day when they first started using D3 and it was way higher concentration. Now there's trace elements in there in, in the supplements we use today. And D3 overdose is not a thing anymore. Exactly. Um, and it, especially in, in for very many cases. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Especially for your breeder females. Yeah, no, yeah. they really need it. They need it. Um, they need extra stuff. They need all they can get during breeding. Season. Yeah. So, uh, I just, and I say D3 overdose is not a thing. D3 overdose is not a thing in nocturnal geckos. I mean, I've heard of certain hyper, you know, issues uh, in some diurnal animals, but that's animals that are soaking in the sunlight all day and on D3 and, you know, that, that kind of conundrum. Um, multivitamin. Do you use multivitamin? No, to be honest, no. I have, but that's mainly because I don't have uh, enough knowledge about that yet. 
So uh, okay, look, Bubba's got good info there because he keeps iguanas, so he's got some some intel there. In naturalistic setups, any excess D three will be metabolically with me metabolized with UV. I'm guessing he was typing there. No overdose. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's uh, and that's kind of what I the gist I've got. Um, and I'm sorry, multivitamin. What are you using? Are you using uh, multivitamin? No. No, not at all. No. Okay. Um, and you're not seeing any, uh, what brand calcium are you using? Uh, I use a mixture of Arcadia and let me see. So Matt. Yeah. Zoom it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but neither one of them has any multivitamin in them. No, I don't okay. think so. maybe the Arcadia, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, well, now that brings me right to my next question, because if you're not using any multivitamin, then I want to know what you're gut loading with, because that's uh, got to be on point to uh, not be able to use any multivitamin without any issues. I use a variety of different vegetables, and okay. I use the insecti fuel from Arcadia Pro. Okay. So this is not an Arcadia commercial, guys. Just so, just no, so everybody's just, aware. Nobody's sponsored by Arcadia. They're welcome to send us money if they want, but or, or product. But uh, no deals have been made with Arcadia before this episode. Oh. Um, so Arcadia gut load and what kind of yeah Flintstones vitamins, right, Bubba? Uh, no. What kind of veggies are you using, Mariah? All kinds of different vegetables. I sometimes use. Uh, it's not kale, but a kind of, it's andive called in the Netherlands. It's it's very uh, rich in all different kinds of stuff. I can Google it if you want. Uh, no, that's I good. Carrots. Dark, <laughs> dark leafy greens, though, mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dark carrots. leafy greens, okay. carrots, paprika, anything. Okay. Um. Yeah, and... Uh, in the Arcadia uh, Insecta Fuel, it has... Vitamin B1, vitamin B2, vitamin B12, vitamin K, and some other ingredients that are not vitamins. And out of curiosity, how many years have you been producing baby fat tails? Out of, you said you started working with them about four years ago. You've been breeding, you've been producing for four years as yeah. well? No, no, only two years. I am not very good at breeding yet. So um, by all means, if you have any uh no I, I, i'm that's why i'm no that's I'm why i'm quizzing sure. you because i'm i've had issues in my experience without having the multivitamin like in in i i use a lot of multivitamin and so i'm i'm quizzing you because i'm curious like if you've not seen any issues i'm trying to figure out is it because she's got these badass setups that have the uvb and and all the heat penetrative light and and maybe they're able to process their own vitamins that they're not able to process in a rack setup because they don't have the the whole gamut of everything so uh, i'm not i'm not trying to beat you down when i'm at, when i'm asking all these questions it's 20 questions because i'm trying to i'm trying to really understand what's going on um so out of those two years how many babies have you produced but i like a dozen or yeah a dozen would be you don't have to give an exact number but like yeah around a, dozen around a dozen total or each year yeah, each year. Each year. Okay, so about 25 babies, roughly. Um, Not a lot. I, I personally would recommend adding some multivitamin into your routine. Um, that's With that said, if you haven't seen any issues at all, if it ain't fi broke, don't fix it, right? But also, you're not looking at a huge sample size with that many babies, right? No. So no. especially if you start seeing any kind of like um, jaw deformities or eye deformities or anything like that. Um, I would definitely jump on some multivitamin. Um, I, I feed multivitamin as much as I feed calcium almost with my fat tails. My yeah. Leo's get it a lot less, but my fat tails get pretty much like a, basically a one to two ratio of multivitamin to calcium, like every feeding. Um, that's just how I operate. Um, and again, I'm not trying to, oh, this is what you need to do again, guys. There's a million different ways to keep every species that you have as long as things are working right, as long as your animals are doing well. Um, no, but you know. to, to add a little on that, this is exactly why we don't need to bash breeders who have do, been doing this for years. This is exactly, exactly the reason, because 
as a naturalistic keeper, you are never done learning. I am absolutely 100% certain. As that. any I'm keeper, building, as any keeper, you're never done learning. To learn. And this stuff, like, you would not easily read about this in a carriage because this is also very uh, relatable to breeding because you would not see issues very quickly. But if there is a time to see it, is during breeding because it takes such an extra toll and just yeah so yeah. and if we see that they need it in breeding then why wouldn't they need it in any case right okay. so why wouldn't we give it to our animals that are just long-term pets if they obviously need it right yeah. um so look there's nick with his with his knowledge i got a little fresh mixed veggies and use rep cow brand yeah but you don't know what you're talking about nick go to sleep man um <laughs> uh no, that that all that's such important aspects. Gut loading, I feel like, is the most important thing about keeping insectivore reptiles, insectivorous reptiles, however you want to say that. Um, whenever I'm at expos, every single person that walks up to my table, I ask them if, I, if they have geckos at home. If their answer is, yeah, I've got a Leo or a fat tail or whatever, anything insectivorous, I ask them what they feed their gecko. I really don't care what they feed their gecko, and I don't ask them what their gecko's name is because I definitely don't care about that. I want to know, I want to get to the next question because once they tell me what they feed their gecko, then my next question is, what do you feed your worms or your crickets or your doobie or whatever that answer was? And 90% of the time, with the exception of Denver, Colorado, Denver, you are the most educated area that I have vended at yet. Denver was about 60%, but everywhere else, it's 90% of the time I get a blank stare and they say, we don't feed them anything. We get them from a pet store and we, we give them that calcium dust. You know, they'll tell me that. And I'm like, all right. And now this is the critical point, guys. If y'all want to learn how to like be at an expo, the critical point in the conversation is right there. Because at that point, you have two options. You can either talk to them like they're an idiot and get them to turn away and go, oh, I'm not listening to anything that guy says. He just pissed me off. Or you can handle it in a way that is like, well, can I help you? You know what I mean? Would you would you be willing to let me help you? And my line that I use is I reach over to my care sheet and I go, well, would you mind if I if I handed you a little bit of extra info because you can never have too much knowledge and knowledge is power. Right. And when you tell people something like that, it kind of catches them off guard and they're like, oh, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. You know, knowledge is power. And sure, why not? I'll take some more knowledge. And they open up a little bit to you. Right. They, they open yeah. up their eyes and they open up their mind and they they open up their physical being to you. Like they're, they're more willing to have the conversation with you. And then you can go into, and, and I, and I hand them my care sheet and I point out, I'm like, look, this first section of my care sheet is about gut loading. And it takes up a third of my care sheet, gut loading and supplementation. So do you, how important do you think that is to me? And I, and I ask them that question. I try to get them thinking about it and engaging. And then I go into exactly what I gut load with. And this is not people I'm selling to guys. This is every freaking person that walks across my table that have a gecko at home. And by doing that, I feel like I'm saving geckos lives every freaking weekend. I go home, even if I don't sell hardly any animals, I go home thinking, oh, I kicked ass there. I just taught all kinds of people how to do better. You know, maybe not my, my way, maybe not the best way, but if they weren't doing anything and they only absorbed gut loading from me whenever they were standing in front of me for five or 10 minutes, then I did my part, I feel like, and I got that little bit of better nutrition in their animal. Because even if they're not, and that's why I asked you about gut loading as soon as you say you weren't using multivitamin, because even if they're not using the multivitamin that I think they should be, or even the calcium that they should be, if they're gut loading like a madman, like just a ninja, you don't have to use any of that stuff a lot of times because those animals, those insects are going to be so incredibly nutritious that it's just going to, it's going to pass right along into the animals. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's really important. I feel like, um, I personally, again, if I were you, I would incorporate a little bit of multivitamin, especially for your breeder females. Yes. Um, it, it just, it, it can't hurt because a lot, like Bubba said, most times any excess just gets passed through. And my yeah. vet has told me that as well. Um, you know, excess, just like with us, if we take too much, multi, too many vitamins or whatever, too much vitamin C, we we'll just piss it out. It just goes through us. Um, what was Bubba's question there, Joe? I missed the first part of it. Let's but see. I, it says, how are naturalistic behaviors? That's a good question too. 
Alrighty. All right. Uh, so my geckos do a little bit of everything. <laughs> they dig in their favorite heights. Uh, at night, they will climb the backgrounds of the enclosure. And what is funny to share is uh, they always poop at the same spot. I, I'm sure sets geckos do that as well. But um, most of my geckos go all the way up to the background, find a corner all the way up in the enclosure, and then do their thing there. What and piglets? They don't even give the bugs a chance to get to Do you keep isopods? Do you keep isopods for breakdown? No? They die. I just uh, spot clean everything myself because, uh, yeah, they die. Okay. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Why do you think they're dying? Do the geckos eat them or are you just, they're just not, not keeping a good population on their own? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think okay. uh, because there are some spots of subfit that get quite dry uh, and then they are, of course, going to their to that specific spot is the best place to be. So then they die or they drown in the water dish. So it's yeah, a I see that a lot too. Both. So uh, that, that might... I, that might go back to my recommendation of maybe trying to have a more like localized corner as a like humid hide, whether that be on your cool side it, with you as warm as temps as you're keeping at night, you could do it on your cool side. Yeah. But to have like a humid burrow, I think you would have a lot more success with your isopods and they're not going to be going into the water bowl as much because they're going to have the hydration they need in that humid corner. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, um, okay. that's that's one thing I always recommend to people anytime they're doing bioactive is to have, just like we have a temperature gradient, you want to have, a, if you have a big enough enclosure, you want to have a humidity gradient if possible. Yeah. And that's one way to do that is to have like a, a humid facility in one of the corners. And then from there, you know, the opposite corner obviously is your dryer corner. Um, so uh, let's see. Next. I guess let's talk about hatchling care. Whenever you hatch a baby, do you just throw it in this big 30 gallon setup that you have all naturalistic and, and say, I hope you work out <laughs> wish, wish you well, see you in a few weeks. Uh, hope you can find your crickets or do you have a more dedicated method to raising your hatchlings? I have a very simple setup for my hatchlings actually that I can show you. I keep my babies in this, uh, rack set up with tubs and okay. I just keep them paper towels in there and just uh, feed them crickets every day. And are they on, you have heat running on the back of those tubs or is that just room temp? Uh, how do you keep those? On the underside of the uh, tubs, I have the heating. And then on the outside. very back, on the very back on the bottom? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what temp do you keep those at? Same temp, 92? Uh, a little bit warmer, actually. I think nine, 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 94, a little okay. bit warmer. Yep. I do the and same with my youngsters, with my little bitty ones. I find especially the ones that are getting sprayed every day. Yeah. Because um, when you add humidity to the environment, you're going to lose a little bit of temperature, right? Yeah. So um, it, feels, it feels the opposite. It feels like it's warmer, but you actually it, – it, it has the opposite effect. Yeah. So – I keep my babies at about 94, 95 degrees. That way, even when I spray them in the morning and it cools down to, you know, the 70 degree water temp that I just sprayed in there, it's a little bit quicker recovery um, back to that 90 degree plus yeah. mark that I think they like. Um, and then you have that just on the back of the tub to where they have a cool sod on the front, right? To where they can escape from that heat if they want. Yeah. So very, it's identical setups then, yeah. hatchling wise. And I, use little, I, I use shoebox tubs. Yeah. With uh, yeah. heat in the back. They're like this size. <coughs> yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. Yep. Nothing special, really. And then I had a whole pack last year, and then I waited until she was six months until I upgraded her to a bigger enclosure. So she was already quite big. Super and did you go straight? Did you go straight to your 30 inch, 30 by 16s? Or did yeah. you go into intermediate? Yeah, straight to the 30? Yeah. And that worked uh, very well. At first, I uh, I fed her with tweezers to make sure she was adjusting well and to make sure that she was eating well. And after that, uh, it, go, it got going. So, uh, yeah. 
but you already knew the gecko really well. You had had her for six months. You hatched her. You knew that she was healthy. Um, and that's what I always tell everybody as well. Whenever they're talking about wanting to go bioactive with the gecko they're getting from me is like, first of all, quarantine is a good practice. No matter if this is your first yep. reptile or not, it's a good thing to get in the practice of. Yep. And it allows you to have a closer observation that allows you more, um, you know, more direct observation of their food intake and their poop outtake and all that good stuff. Yep. For the first couple months. And yes. what I tell people is after three months, once you've educated yourself by watching good stuff like this or, you know, reading good care sheets that don't have ridiculous lows on them, yeah. then, um, which by the way, guys, Reptophiles, her care sheet, which is a bioactive based care sheet, she's already, I've talked with her and she's going to make an adjustment on hers. Her care sheet will be correct. So we're going to move forward with her care sheet you know, in the future, as far as recommendations or Mariah's obviously. Um, but <laughs> the, that, that natural, that naturalistic setup to throw a new animal in there, even if it's an adult and you don't know that animal. And especially if you've never had that species, I think you're running a risk regardless because you, you don't know what to look for. You don't know what you're, what you're trying to look for. You don't know what they should act like because you've never had one. Yeah. So I always tell people like start out like this simple Simon. I actually sell these little starter kits that are really simple for very affordable prices. And then that gives you some time to really educate yourself further and figure out exactly how you want to do things. And, but that's, that's an important point is even especially babies, but even newer adults that you bring in need to be on a more simple setup to be able yeah. to observe them properly. Right. Um, um, let's see. Supplemental heat. I'm just looking at my notes right here. Supplemental heat, heat retention. So do you have any heat retention material in your enclosures the way you have them set up? Do you have like slate rock stacked up underneath your heat source or what are you doing there? No, I, I don't. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, enclosure material is very isolating and that keeps the warmth in. And I, my personal opinion is that the natural substrate in the wild doesn't have these weird flat rocks so i don't use them myself it just wouldn't make sense to me i do have uh fake termite mounds that are made of expanding foam so that's also a little bit of isolation going on there and that's on the warm side of the enclosure so that's the only type of isolation i got going on but not how something. did you make how did you make those uh, I um, I had a flower pot and then I put a shitload of uh, expanding foam on it and then I put towel glue on it and then I threw all uh, kinds of substrate on it. So I can show you. Uh, That's a good question, Ella. While she gets that, I'm going to answer Ella's question as far as how I operate. Okay. I don't have a night drop for, for my hatchlings. I... My room does cool off a little bit at night, so they have a little bit of a night drop just from the natural environment. Oh, that's cool. Same. Yeah. That's neat. So you put it on some wax paper to make it, and then you just, like, carved holes out of it? or? Yeah. yeah. I tried to be just really messy and looked at Dave Kaufman's video to... Uh... I love it. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, create that. Neat. <clears throat> and that's their preferred hide for the most part, for most of them? Uh, for about... 60%. Okay. I got Cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question, cause this is the question or the, the, uh, accusation that the, not the advancing husbandry keepers are going to make is, do you think that if you had more insulating heat retention material in your enclosure, that you would not need the supplemental heat pad that you're using? No, absolutely not. I, when I first started uh, keeping Feto geckos or one Feto gecko, I did have those weird flat slates and it actually got colder during the night. <laughs> that is insane to say to these people maybe, but um, yes, it gets warm during the day. It's a nice warm slate, but yeah, it, if it cools down, the stone gets stone cold. So no. I would Good not point. say yeah, it's not necessary to have any heat if you use a slate. Okay. And <laughs> and I'll I'll lean back on my point of like in the wild these termite mounds retain this heat that they absorbed all day and now we need to try to replicate that and whenever our lights go out at 8 p.m. and our house is 70 degrees it doesn't take very long maybe a few hours for that enclosure even with a 
proper hide stack of heat retention material, it yeah. doesn't take long for that heat to dissipate from that material. And then in a matter of hours, your entire enclosure is 70 degrees and your fat tail is roaming around why wondering why it's winter every freaking night. Yeah. And uh, I, I just really want to stress that and make, try to hopefully some of these, these, these naysayers are going to see this and, and realize and understand that I'm not like just talking out of my ass. And, and like, I kind of have an idea what I'm, what I'm dealing with here. Um, it's really important to try to mimic that, that heat retention that they have in the wild and in the wild, there's no way that those termite mounds are dropping very quickly during the night. If it happens a few months out of the year, again, if you want a brewmate, cool, but not every night. And so to me, an under tank heater used the right way on a thermostat only at night, however you want to slice it, a under tank heater used the right way in combination with a heat lamp. And this is exactly what my video was about a couple of days ago that everybody was like, Oh, you're crazy. Um, I think that's the best combo, exactly what you're doing, because at night when that heating pad kicks on, that's mim mimicking that ground heat yeah. that's holding in the wild. And without that, in some degree, and you can do it on a different, you know, you can do that on like a graduating timer if you want, or have it only kick on in the latter part of the evening, you know, or, or in the first part of the evening, but not in the latter part of the evening, whatever. Yeah. Anything is better than nothing. But I can't stress enough how much I feel like we really, really need people to understand that especially these babies need that nighttime temp. And somebody, uh, Ella asked an important question earlier about the baby drop, uh, if we drop our babies. And I quickly answered, no, I keep my babies. They are they automatically have a small uh, nighttime drop because of the, the room cooling down. But furthermore, uh, whenever Dave on that Dave Coffin video, I, uh, not to keep pointing back to this one resource, but it's one of the best resources we have. Whenever they harvested those babies, they were very new babies. Yes. But they were in that mound at night. They yeah. weren't out roaming around in the cool nighttime air. They were still buried in that mound that I was just talking about is retaining heat. So for my babies, I do not have much of a, uh, much of a night drop at all. Yes, Bubba's right. They, you can use, if you have a, a quality thermostat, you can program a night drop in there uh, to where, you know, like I was talking about, using the conjunction of heat lamp and heat under tank heater, you can really use these tools to your disposal, at your disposal, in a very efficient way if you think outside the box and yeah. not just like, oh, well, this is, you know, what this care sheet said, so I'm going to do that. And that's one thing, like, I'm really not a huge fan of care sheets as much as I hand them out. I don't think there's one black and white way to do these things, but I still hand the care sheets out because I need people to have at least some way um, to, to focus on and get started. And then again, they can learn from there, but we've got to get them started off on the right foot. Otherwise they're going to have a, an unsuccessful experience and go, Oh, fat tails are too hard. I'm not messing with them. Yeah. Um, I agree. And it's just, they're not that much harder. You just, can't have the same level of error you can for a leo that's all there is to it for a leo yeah. you can have that night drop because in afghanistan you know so you know foothill regions where those animals live a lot it cools off pretty significantly at night you know and they don't have necessarily as big a deep burrows that they constantly live in to be able to escape to so yeah i think it's a much more feasible setup for a leopard gecko and i think that's a lot of the the information gap is a lot of these care sheets are just leopard gecko care sheets, myself included, that are just converted like, oh, and this is different for AFTs. Like that's all I have a, a care sheet that says Leo and AFT care sheet. And then in certain spots, I'll have in parentheses this for fat tails, just yeah. as far as like the temperature range being tighter and the humidity needing to be a little bit higher and then needing, you know, a little bit more access to fresh water. Um, so, yeah, that's my that's my deal on that. Um so, Mariah, uh, Clint just asked, what's your favorite AFT morph? Yeah, we need to catch up on quite a few questions. I think Ella was... Yeah, through. right? Um, We're just rambling. Yeah. Uh, I don't drop my hatchling temperatures at all. Okay. Yeah. So, that I keep that one stable. Because hatchlings are just way more fragile than adults. And I don't mess with that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then is 20 degrees Celsius too cold at night, you think? What is 20 degrees in Fahrenheit? That's about, what, 70? Uh, I don't know. You got, I, you got your what? converter out still? Uh, 
Let me Google it. Google that shit. Uh, 68. It is a little on the cold side, yeah. 68. Yeah, that's a little bit. In my opinion, that's too cold. I, I would not get below 75 Fahrenheit for cool cool temps. That's my recommendation. Um, I just don't see any need for it. Again, other than if you want to simulate brumation a few months out of the year. But as far as all year long, 75 is a minimum nighttime temp for me. Um, that's that's my recommendation. Uh, what's your favorite morph? What I? There's a reason I have 17 geckos. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pick one, but I do have a weak spot for patternless somehow because I have four patternless out of my 17 geckos. So unconscious, subconsciously, I might have. It's happening, right? It's just that yeah. way. I like the patternless morph, but if you ask me tomorrow, I like, uh, I don't know ghost uh, <laughs> zulu white out zulu <laughs> i uh yeah it's hard to say your favorite <laughs> what about yeah you? that's a good good point bubba care guide you still got to find your way it's just a guide it's just a starter it's not a it's not a bible uh my my favorite morph maria you know my favorite morph come on you have to know my favorite morph white out person? yes yes <laughs> of course white out Whiteout is my favorite morph, one hundred percent. Mango Project Whiteout, to be exact, which is just a project. Everybody, oh it's just, God, it's just some tangy whiteouts with a lot of lavenders that hold in there. Um, but yeah, Whiteout's definitely my favorite morph because of the variety that it expresses. Because you can have one Whiteout that throws just so many different offspring, and it visual on the visual palette, it just has a lot of different variety. I think. Um, and I'm working on uh, Amel Ghost. Hopefully those will be cool. Yeah. My vision is a fluorescent purple and orange gecko because the ghosts have a lot of actual lavender in their banding, not like the white that people call lavender, but actual lavender. And then if the tangerine Amel background comes through, then that should be fluorescent orange, right? Like, yeah. In theory. So. so, yeah, that's my thought on an Amel Ghost is it's going to be a fluorescent purple and orange fat tail. That's going to be cool, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Got a bunch of those growing, a bunch of d double and triple heads growing out of those. I got some patty head AML ghosts and some some triple head AML ghost patties and nice. all kind of cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's my favorite morph. Uh, what, do we have any more questions before I go on to uh, like what I had written down? I had jotted down some, some notes. I don't see any. Did we questions. get all the questions? I don't have it open. My ADD is killing me. Um, so I'm going to go through real quick. I had just jotted down like the benefits that I think of, you know, rat keeping and then some of the drawbacks, in my opinion, from my experience. Um, the main benefit, obviously, is it's a m the most controlled environment we can have. So whenever you've got a uh, high capacity of animals that you're trying to work with, um, it's the it's the best way, not just the easiest or cheapest way. Um, it's the best way to be able to keep a large amount of animals clean and well observed and be able to know exactly what's going in and coming out of them um, without too much guesswork. Right. Yeah. Um, and along with that is the space that it allows to be able to keep a large quantity of animals, to be able to have a good genetic diversity because a being a super, what's that? I can I jump in for one. Yes, person? please, please, please. Something that a lot of people really don't realize is how much animals it takes to uh, have a project going on. Like for me, yes. it's very straightforward. I want to create some Zulus now. I have a female that's Zulu. I have a male that's Zulu. Ta-da, Zulus. But for a black velvet project or a high quality mango project, you need a really big breeding group to have uh, that strong lineage while still... Uh, preventing inbreeding issues and i think really people don't see that people don't realize that but i can guarantee exactly. if i had 100 enclosures i wouldn't be able to maintain the same level of care for all of my geckos that would, that right. would be impossible so i think yeah. that's what a lot of people uh forget no that's that's a that's exactly the point i was about to make Mariah. is that it, in in order to be able to provide the correct, in my opinion, the correct genetic diversity um, that needs to be provided in these projects, you have to have a 
big, you know, sample size and a lot of, uh, you know, several animals to be able to work with. And that's not to say that every animal is a number or it's all about the money or any of that nonsense. That's just to say, like, in my ethically bound way that I'm determined to do this, I want to make sure that I'm selling people animals that are going to be, uh, you know, good potential projects for them and project animals for them and not something that is already so inbred that they can't do anything with if they want to try to breed and do their own kind of projects. Um, the only way to do that, in my opinion, is to have the space to be able to keep the amount of animals to be able to do those bigger projects. Um, yeah. And if that's not your thing and you want to just only have a handful of animals and be on a much smaller scale, that's awesome. Make sure that your foundation animals are very unrelated and you can probably get away with quite a bit of that even on a small scale or just don't keep very much. Like you only kept one whole back you said so far, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I'd do if I had to pick only one whole back a year. <laughs> it, it would drive me insane. Um, so that's kind of the, the main point there is that like a lot of people frown upon rat keeping and frown upon breeders and bigger breeders and, and how they do things. And I certainly agree that there's a lot of uh, improvement to be made in the breeder side of things. And, and I'm personally working to improve my ways of keeping every day. And like you said earlier, you, you know, you say keepers don't stop learning. Anybody doesn't stop learning. You said naturalist keepers. If you stop learning, then you're going down the right, the wrong road. I really feel like anytime you stop, you know, yearning for that new information you're you're doing yourself a disservice but um anyway uh that that's just my gist on it you know i feel like you really need to have a lot of space for genetic diversity if you're going to try to do big long-term projects um, yes. and without that you're setting yourself up or you're setting either yourself or your clients or customers up for failure by passing on faulty genetics that haven't been as outcrossed as I feel like they should. Again, this is just my opinion. I feel like there's too much inbreeding going on in reptiles in general. Yeah. People just don't care about it because it's just been done for so many years. I think that it's just like a, a uh, an afterthought for a lot of people, um, especially some of the old older school keepers that I hang out with at some of the shows and, uh, and I spend some time with. Like it's even less of, you know, more of an afterthought for them because they just, it's just what they always did because back whenever they were first getting reptiles in, you got a pair into the country and that was the founding pair. And the only way to propagate them was to inbreed, right? There yeah. was no other way. Um, so I get it. I understand where it came from. But with certain species like the fat tails, we have plenty of genetic diversity available. So why not use it? Why not? Like I've got a lot of wild caught lines in my projects that I'm like constantly injecting into things to make sure that I've always got fresh genetics running through there. Um, you know, I've got visual Oreos, visual emails, all kind of visuals that have a lot of wild caught blood in them. Um, yeah. And that's that's part of that that quest for like having the most robust, healthy animals. Um, Nick mentioned something about brumation uh, and Bubba was kind of chiming in on it a little bit, too. Yeah, brumation is actually something I think I'm going to try a little bit more of this year, Nick, um, because this last season for me has been a little bit hit or miss. Um so I think I'm going to probably pick your brain about that a little bit and see exactly what you do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Everybody's geckos are too damn fat. Uh, brumation gives you better and more babies. Let's talk about that for a minute. That's a good point, Bubba. Uh, obesity, obesity and reptiles. It is far, far too common. Yeah. People. Uh, and I get it. A lot of people, when they get reptiles, one of the funnest thing about having reptiles is feeding them and watching them eat and watching them chase their bugs around and shake their little tail. I get it. Okay. But, you need to really take notice of what these animals are supposed to look like with that. You know, all these, again, back to the naturalistic keeping. Um, some of those naturalistic keepers that I see posting their animals in their natural setups basking in the sunlight are very obese. Yeah. You know, if you're going to try to keep them as close to natural as possible, feed them less because <laughs> in the wild, they're having to, they're having to struggle a little bit. And if you see a wild fat tail, they are rare. I don't know where they got their name from originally other than the bulbous tails that they regrow because in the wild, none of them have very fat tails unless they have a regrow. So, um, yeah, that's a perfect example. Look how yep. lean that animal is. I agree. Not it's a big, huge fat tail. Um, 
And then the so, yeah. females during breeding season, I have them a little bit fatter because they can lose some weight, but that's that's a little bit of a different situation, in my opinion. So I'm going to run through this list real quick and then we'll jump on to something else. we got a little bit of time left and we don't necessarily have to end at any certain time, but I, I know you have time constraints because it's getting late over there. So you just let me know when you want to wrap this up. Uh, um, I'm awake. <laughs> you're what? You're good? Yeah. All right. Uh, some of the other benefits to racks, uh, they're super easy to clean. You can really have a good sterile environment, way different than in, you know, the naturalistic setups, which again, if you have a smaller collection, that's probably not as big of a deal, but if you have a really big collection, like I have grown to have, um, it's pretty important to be able to be nice and clean and sterile, especially when you're moving animals in and out, you know, or, or selling animals and then got fresh babies coming up into the new tubs. You want to be able to sterilize things really, act really well. Um, yeah. That's a good question. How long do 15 bottles take to clean? Hang on, let me finish this real quick. And I also I already mentioned, you know, the easy to observe the intake and output of your animals in the racks. That's that's important to me, especially during breeding season when I have females. I need to know if they're eating or not. And if crickets yeah. are going and hiding behind something and I don't realize it, and those females didn't eat that week guys listen these fat tails can go down so fast and so hard yeah i mean they, it does not take much more than a missed couple meals in the right time of their season and you've all of a sudden got a fat tail on her on death's door they are very very fragile and yeah. i can't stress that enough that's the biggest difference in my eyes between f breeding leos and fat tails is that the fat tails they just i don't know what it is it's usually around the third clutch of the season if they're not on point, they will just crash hard. And I've, I've seen it time and time again. It's not just one animal. It's not just a group of animals. It's like just randomly sometimes if they miss a couple meals, they just, and uh, it's hard to bring them back sometimes. Um, so that's my reasons for, you know, liking using racks. Um, drawbacks, they're very basic. They lack stimulus, obviously. Um, a lot of people try to, Ella's one, that does kind of a, a, a hybrid, you know, a rack setup. She does tubs, but she has substrate and leaf litter. And, you know, she tries to get as naturalistic as she can in that tub setup. Now, I assume she's not using basking lamps. So she's, you know, in many people's eyes, she's missing the mark there. But she's doing way better than I am. I have, you know, a pretty basic hide or a pretty basic tub with a nice hide in the right spot, a nice adequate humid hide. And a decent sized piece of cork bark for every gecko. That way they have some texture differences. They have some, you know, that cork bark will kind of rock around a little bit when they climb on it. So it's not just super laboratory basic, but it's not much. It's, it's a lot less than a lot of other people keep. And, and that's one thing I'm trying to improve on um, is trying to, and that's part of this conversation is me trying to figure out exactly what direction I want to go with my collection. Cause I plan to downsize a little bit and try to focus a little bit more on elevating my, my uh my enclosures and having that a little bit more um geared towards you know the animals overall yeah. enrichment and not just okay they're super healthy and i don't have any shed issues and every, everybody's breeding well so let's call it good i'm yeah. i'm not that i'm not that easily satisfied personally um so they're basic um they are sometimes inconsistent um if you have too big of a rack trying to run off of a single thermostat channel you will get a pretty wide range of, of temps um like the, the very bottom and top might be 88 degrees and the middle might be 94 degrees you know if you have a good idea of what you're dealing with and you don't have a very cold room then that 88 degree mark isn't a big deal um but conversely, if you have a pretty hot room, that 94 degree mark without any kind of significant cool down could be a little bit too much to heat stress those, those geckos. So it's a fine balance there. Sometimes they can be inconsistent if you don't have like a really nice professionally made rack that's not overloading a single channel. You got to really dedicate your channels. Don't be shy about doing, you know, plenty of channels per rack or per set of racks. Um, and we can get into that more later on another video. Uh, just that's kind of a, a, a run down there. And they're freaking ugly. They're <laughs> ugly compared to like I went to my friend Brittany's collection a while back. She's a heartbeat reptiles. Go check her out. guys. She's got one of the most versatile, uh, eclectic rep uh, or, or just awesome collections that I've ever seen. But I went and check out her collection. I was blown away. 
She's got, I mean, nice, beautiful enclosures for almost every animal. And like just her enclosures alone make you just flabbergasted, much less the animals that are within them. Um, so, you know, that's somebody that I've kind of like seen how she's doing it. And I'm trying to like figure out how to get in that direction. Even if I don't go all the way, the way that she has set up, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's needs are different. Everybody's animals needs are different, but I, I'm really jealous of how she's doing things. She's, she makes me feel like a piece of shit, honestly. Um, she's just killing it. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's a big thing for me is visually appealing. They're not that visually appealing. You can see my racks over my shoulder back here. You know, it's just, it's just a, a, a room of tubs, you know, it's nothing impressive. The animals in them are really impressive, but it's not that awe inspiring to see a room of tubs. It's like, Oh, that's a bunch of geckos, but that's about it. Um, anyway, that's it. That's all I had on notes. Um, we can just uh, kind of go I, from there. Uh, you can easily implement one easy thing maybe to uh enhance your racks a little bit without chasing yep. too much i don't know okay. just food for thought but no please I, I use different kind of textures in my tips so i have the paper towels and then i have have some fake plants these are easy to clean whatever that's a different texture and then i have the the, the simple plastic hide of course and the right unit and then I have these little pieces of cork bark, yeah, which are also yeah, just a different texture. I think um, fatso geckos do a lot of thing by uh, flicking their thumb against different kind of objects to kind of explore. And I think that that would be a way to easily enrich uh, tanks, uh, racks in that way. Just, just yeah. No, I agree. I actually, I've fairly recently, like in the last year, started incorporating at least cork bark into all my tubs. Um, uh, I, I don't have the, the fake plants in there, but I have, I have the cork bark and they have, all of my geckos have a humid hide, so they all have dirt to be able to dig in and have that sensation. Um, but no, I agree that the more textures you can get in there, the better. Um, what's up, Joe? Uh I've been here the whole so, time. I've just been uh, kind of in the background so you guys could. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's going For really sure. well. Um, a lot of uh, good information. Is there anything you can think of that we have not gone over? We have Or one. that you were hoping that we that we talked about? What? What, Marai? We have one missed question. Oh, what is it? I'm glad you're watching because I can't, I can't do two things at once. I, my ADD is too intense. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually uh, my question. So you had talked oh, about, yeah. um, you know, cleaning racks and how it's a little bit quicker. I do. I did wonder how long. I kind of guesstimated you clean about fifteen of those things, um, and I, I was wondering how long does that take? And how often did yeah, you, do uh, you do it? Uh, I clean uh, three times a week. So the spots cleaning and the water bowls to make sure they're clean because the water bowls get. Uh, algae in them if I don't change them often enough because lights and LED and shit. So uh, that I do three times a week and the feeding uh, I do also three times a week and then uh, every other day I miss the enclosures and once a week I will uh, water the plants. And I don't exactly measure it, but I think everything about maintenance costs me a couple of hours each time I'm in the enclosure room. So okay. uh, that's quite a few hours I spend every week to keep up with this. Okay. Sounds all right. How, how many times would you say a week that you open up a rack for a specific animal? Because I kind of have the idea of how many times she's seeing her animals. Uh, um, so my babies what? my babies are uh, about three times a week, and my adults are about twice a week um, that, I'm, that I'm laying eyes on each animal. So it's, pretty, um, it's pretty similar between the two pretty, types. Yeah, of pretty people. close. Well, I pretty do <laughs> I do start almost every day with looking at my geckos just for fun. I know them all very personally. That's uh, why I'm less worried about them getting sick because I'm really personable with them. Uh, so I do see them every day, but just for maintenance three times a week. But that's only because I I don't have a lot of geckos. That makes it just very easy. So yeah. Seventeen is a lot of geckos, in my opinion. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. In that sense, yeah. But I don't have any major breeding 
projects going on. But I, I wonder if I could ask you to do a little experiment with your setups. Yes. If you would be willing to, I know it might stress them out a little bit, but if you would be willing to, I wonder if you'd be willing to cut off the under tank heater on a few of your adult males for a few weeks and see how they react and record that, not necessarily record video record, but just record that data for us to be able to kind of, and, and what's your room and also record what their actual room temp is in there. So like, what are they going to drop down to? Yeah. Cause I'd be curious to see if they're like more active Roman looking for their spot or if their appetite decreases or like, I, I'm, I'm just, or if they come out earlier to go absorb some heat because they start figuring out that they're not going to have it overnight. I'm, I'm curious if that would affect them or how it would affect them. I'm sure it would affect them, but I'm I curious back, to, back to the whole night drop thing. Just since you already had, I'm planning on doing my own experiment, experiment, but it's going to take some time to get it all set up and dialed in. But since you've already got them rocking and rolling and you know how they act and have such a good, you know, have s such a good eye on them. I wonder if uh, there's an animal getting out behind you, Mariah. Oh yeah. Somebody just, one of them just dropped to the ground. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it okay? Poor little guy, this never happens. And then the one time I'm on the podcast where everyone can see it on the live, then it He's happens. all right. He's That's all okay. right. I didn't yeah, notice it right away. He's actually my, he's a leopard gecko. He identifies as a leopard gecko. He's one oh. of the social geckos. <laughs> he identifies as a leopard gecko. I'm not surprised. He's, yeah, he's, sometimes he's begging for me to take him out. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that was Gamba. <laughs> So that's our fault. We we were asking you too many too many questions and making you dig in your enclosures. Don't worry about it. It'll be all right. I actually was watching that longer than I should have before I said <laughs> I didn't want to be interruptive and I thought, am I seeing am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And in the back of my head, I'll be honest, like I they, they jump out and they fall and hit the ground all the time and they're perfectly fine. So I know that kind of <laughs> Kind of, I thought it'll be all right. It didn't look too high up, but it'll I'm, be all right. Yeah, he's fine, but I'm embarrassed. That's okay. <laughs> uh, um, let's talk about shit. I don't know. We we went over a lot. Is there anything you can think of that we didn't touch on, Mariah? Uh, not really. No. If the people who are watching have any questions, shoot away. What about, um, let's see, Joe did a, an episode not too long ago talking about like mentorship and stuff like that. Who who have you on that end of the world uh, kind of learned from over the over the last four years? And like who, where have your animals, where have you sourced your animals from and all that? Yeah, uh, um, I have learned everything from a breeder from the Netherlands. He has quit the hobby, unfortunately. Um, which makes me really sad. But his name is Tim de Lange. Um, he has been keeping Veto geckos for a long time in the Netherlands. And he, have, he has answered every question that I have. And yeah, I, I have a lot of Veto geckos from him, actually. And a few from uh, Gecko Maniacs. So, okay. yeah, that was my biggest inspiration. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Yeah, so yeah. Well, I don't know if I have anything else that uh let me see, let me look over my care sheet real quick to make sure I'm not missing anything that I want to talk about on their general care just for it to be here. How often do you feed your uh, your juveniles, your babies? But I uh, I do that every every other day, three times a week. Uh, my hatchlings every day and uh, juveniles every other day. Okay. And then yeah. your adults, how often do you feed them? Three times a week. Three times a week? Okay. Yeah. See, I'm more like about, I'm like every other day for the babies and then about three times a week for the juveniles and then twice a week for the fat, for the adults is, is my feeding regimen. Um, I, I had one um, for Mariah. Um, are where you live, are racks something you're allowed to keep? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I forgot um, about that. <laughs> Officially, no. Uh, yeah. On the record, no. But everyone does it. So. Okay. 
What, what's yeah, the I mean, behind that? Is the government involved or maybe an animal? Um, there are some guidelines, uh, but there is no control in any way and there are no laws in any way. So it makes it very hard to have anything hard to say like this you can do because it's, yeah, there's no regulation really. Not even on the reptile species to keep, honestly, at this point. So, yeah. So there's there's not actually any laws, so there's no enforcement of it, but there are like recommendations that are made by yeah. certain societies yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, there are only regulations for the reptile expose themselves, but not for uh, the way we keep them, except gotcha. sizes and that sort of uh, official legislations. That's different. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm just looking at my care sheet real quick, guys. Uh, let's talk about how you record your temperature because that's something that I think a lot of people are missing. I use an infrared temp gun. I have several of them. You get what you pay for with them. If you buy the $10 ones, you get $10 worth of a temp gun. I recommend the around $30 ones. That's kind of the best bang for your buck. Yep. You don't need a $100 one, but don't buy the $10 ones. But that yep. is the most useful tool that you can have if you have a single reptile. And the great thing is all you need is one, even if you have a thousand reptiles. Yep. So um infrared temp gun if you don't have one get it now Absolutely. like yesterday if I, um, if I may i actually do air conditioning uh heating ventilation and cooling yeah you probably got and some insight on that we, we actually will uh small disagreement there so they have a, a meter that's typically a temp gun sorry that's um typically 200 dollars tip it'll go on sale all the time for 100 bucks and i do for accurate temperature readings you have to remember it's measuring the temperature in between as well um, and so the closer you can get better, and obviously you guys are right up on the temp, so it'll work well. The Fluke, uh, F-L-U-K-E, Fluke has the best temperature gun that I've ever worked with when it comes to that spatial distance. Um, and you think that it's worth the money to, to get, get that $100 one, Joe? Is that because much more accurate? Because you just said a second ago where you only have to use it buy it once and then you can use it forever, I absolutely do. Um, if I drop one off a roof or whatever, uh, or out of an attic and break it, I get online and I grab another one right away for my job. Oh, they got warranty. And, I, and uh, when it came to me wanting to get accurate temperatures just because of how, you know, digestion works, um, I won't go too far into that. I grabbed a fluke meter. Um, it's a quick $100 bill. I can find it for a little less than that actually on Amazon for you if anybody's interested. Um, I, I recommend them just because when I'm diagnosing uh, in a completely other area, I prefer to have accurate readings and there's a five to seven, sometimes eight degree difference between cheap meters and a fluke meter. So, wow, really that much? Infrared. Yeah, yep. So I, I just invite folks if you want an accurate reading, um, you know, uh, either a, you can get a, it's a psychrometer, or you can get uh, a fluke meter. The fluke meters work really well. I use them for air conditioning. It helps me with my how I. And fluke, is, fluke is the brand, right? Yeah, F L U K E. It's just it's, it's, a, nice it's a temp gun. It's it's just a regular temp gun like we're talking about, right? It's just a certain brand. It is, yes. It's, it works gotcha. better than the Milwaukee, which is what I had before. Uh, Milwaukee is probably the better one before I got my fluke meter, and that that thing is. <coughs> as as psychrometers, I can get it. So. Cool. Um. Yeah. So get a temp gun, everybody. Thirty thirty dollar one, hundred dollar one, whatever. Get a temp gun. Um, sorry guys, I'm just kind of going over this to make sure I'm not missing anything. I think we covered it all guys. Is there anybody in the comments that is, uh, missing something thought they were going to get when they came and didn't get it or like, or, or, or did everybody get their fix? Everybody <laughs> get their gecko fix? Oh, uh, anybody Love what you got? Flip that. Yeah. Flip that. I like it. Uh, humid hide. I can't, I can't stress how important a humid hide is, uh, you know, in my opinion, in every enclosure, even if you're doing a naturalistic enclosure, apparently, you know, Madaya's got it dialed in to where she doesn't need one, but, um, I, I recommend having one personally. I think that it doesn't hurt to have that one spot that's a hundred percent humidity all the time. That way, if they need it, they have it. So this right here. 
Same same brain we're using in the medical field. We give them 30 party calibrated and they were always within. Yep. Cool. Good to know. Well, I'll change my recommendation there. Y'all definitely taught me something today uh, of, of all the other things I learned today. Um, Man, I guess that's it, guys. I thought this was going to take two hours, and we hit it on the nut, didn't we? Yeah, you're just shy of it. It's awesome. Um, Mariah, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Good. I'm glad I'm glad you had fun. I, I did, too. I appreciate you, you uh, being up for it, because I know it was kind of last minute, and I was like, hey, let's do this. Um, Joe, likewise. I know it was last minute. I appreciate you putting it together. Absolutely. And I think we need to start doing shit like this more often because I think that this is the kind of conversation that is going to change how this, the direction this hobby is headed in. And it's, and without these kind of conversations, it's not ever going to change. Um, I just like to add whether you prefer a naturalistic buyer or rec setup, ultimately those decisions or should be entirely based upon your specific geckos requirements. Exactly. hundred percent is, you know, yeah. I couldn't agree more, Heidi. Um, make sure that you are focusing on the needs of that animal. Uh, yep. yep. If you have yeah, neurological I, I issues, MBD, albinos sometimes can't thrive. It, it, yep. hundred um, yeah, percent. There's a, a small lag between YouTube and here. So I'm glad I got those up while you were, before you ended. Um, personally, I wanted to thank both of you for offering to come on here. This was a really good idea. Seth and I've been talking about for a couple of days. And uh, he's very open to it. And it was really nice to meet you, Mariah. Um, you. Uh, hopefully we can have you on as a guest sometime here in the near future. I'd be and, down uh, for it. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Seth, I think you did a really great job, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I had fun. It was, it was as I expected, a very good conversation. I was able to learn a lot to be able to pass on to my customers and it's going to be a great resource for me to be able to just tell people, Hey, go check out this podcast. Um, yeah. and they can spend two hours digesting this and then come back to me or hit you up Mariah with their questions. Yeah. Um, yep. now so, I have both of your Instagrams plugged obviously in the description. Is there anything that either of you would like to have plugged before we end Facebook and morph market? If you want, um, I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to. I'd have to get you the link here in a minute. Once while we're while we're waiting on the the upload to happen. Um, oh, by the way, Mariah, uh, don't log off whenever we first in the yep. live. Okay. Got it. Um, but no, I, uh, I again, I really appreciate you coming on, Mariah. I want to try to do start doing things like this on a much more regular basis. I think that uh, there's not enough of these conversations on record for people to be able to learn from and, yeah. and, 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 uh, refer to. Um, and I think we need more of it. I think we need, we need absolute more of it. Um, 100%. and anybody that's out there that has something that they want to talk about or wants to learn more about, um, please reach out. Let's, let's figure something out. Let's put something together. Um, definitely, Go check out my YouTube. There's hardly anything on there now, guys, but I promise you I am going to dedicate myself to making at least one video a week to put up there that's going to be one specific thing about fat tails that is a care, you know, or, or husbandry video. Some of them might be five minutes. Some of them might be 20 minutes. Some of them might be 30 minutes. I don't know. But I promise that I'm going to dedicate myself to getting more content on there because there's not enough information about this species out there. And I'm realizing that and I want to change that. So go check out my YouTube, be patient with it. It's going to eventually be there, but that's something that I definitely am going to be focused on moving forward. So um, hopefully that is something that people can use and will be a good resource for people. Um, thanks everybody in the comments for, for having some involvement and input. Cause it's really nice to not just talk to, Mariah and and Joe, but to have other people kind of filling in those gaps because I had a direction I wanted to go and we covered a lot, but we definitely got some good questions out of the out of the comments. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Absolutely. Um, and that's about it. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, I love this hobby. I love what I do. I love most of the people I meet. I've got a funny saying when people ask me what my favorite part about the hobby is, I tell them the people I meet when I. They ask me what my least favorite part about the hobby is. It's the same damn answer. Um, you know, I, 
I, I, I, I, there's there, just like everything in life, there's both ends of the spectrum. So, um, I'm glad to be able to locate and, and, uh, engage with some of the people that I do enjoy. So thanks everybody for tuning in and sticking around. I know it was a long two hours. Hopefully everybody got something out of it and I guess we'll see everybody later. Huh? That's two hours on the mark. See everybody. Later guys.